This inheritance gave him two copies of the independence gene and a point of view which he's going to express today, I think. <laughs> he did all he did all but a thesis in a math PhD in symbolic logic. I've got a book on that. I'll bring it over. You can figure it out for me. Oh. <laughs> Wanting to know about thinking, Jim was then advised to learn biology. So then he bravely did an, a Master of Science and a PhD in Physiology and Neuroscience. Jim has taught computer science and then moved on to Physiology and Neuroscience at the University of Toronto. And in his own words, knew, knows too much about everything. <laughs> He did mathematics on papers on neurons and synapses. And now retired, he plays competitive squash, leisurely tennis, and is working on a model for Alzheimer's disease and human violence. Jim learned to sail at a Boy Scout cap, and for 30 years he had a sailboat on Lake Champlain and then on Georgian Bay. Please give Jim a warm shellback luncheon. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can help you. Sure, I was supposed to have mine afterwards. All righty. Thank you, Jim. Now, do we need up updating on the uh, upgrading on the speaker? Volume one. Good microphone. Uh, I right think so. I can speak up enough. Oh! oh. <laughs> we put it back where it is, which is why you couldn't see it because it's not where it is. So it's it's, it's, it's like me. Like Can you all hear me? Thank you. Okay. Well, I got very curious about human behavior, and um, and I also really believe in evolution, and so you'll see the mixture of that in my talk. Uh, I, can, I want to be able to see. There. Evolution from the smallest animals to the largest animals, this violence is uh, survival behavior, including humans. And why is that? Uh, we, animals fight for dominance to have territory, food, and mating. Uh, today we will, we're on in a secure environment, our earth from which we originated. And my security is my little bilge keel 24 which is not a racing boat at all. <laughs> it's a bilge keel. And just when the tide goes out, the boat doesn't fall over. An English design. So I like sailing, but I also like anchoring and lying in the sun and swimming. Uh, we have secure here in a safe, sheltered abundance of food and, of course, learning opportunities. <laughs> For most primitive animals are competitive. For example, ant colonies all fight for food and territory. Even the simplest fish. For example, the rift flake uh, chicklets are one of the most aggressive fishes and um, aggressive to others. And they're difficult to keep as adults without breeding them to replenish the population. And males will slowly but surely kill each other in territory battles. And here's a picture of the chicklets. This goes up the evolutionary tree, all the way up to humans from which we have evolved to the lower animals. And to put it in the sailor's context, let's look at pirates, <laughs> who can be really bad. <laughs> and we won't talk about 
how we set how they separate parts of other people from their bodies. <laughs> and this will be a quite uh, sanitized version of that. One of the really neat things I found in my uh, terminal case of piles of books at home, when I moved my research office home, I discovered this really neat book, first published in 1837. And it's gone through eight editions. And recently, um, the Marine Research Society republished it. Um, and there's a long list, over 20 pirates, which are quite well documented in this book. Um, I will only talk about two or three of them which are most interesting because it would be boring to go through all their violence and their gun counts on their ships and how they sold them and their trade. Uh, one of the first things about pirates is it started early in the early Anglo-Saxon world in the North Sea. The Saxons and um, took up and um, <clears throat> and the princes in the various regions found that they could go and rob for food and territory and other humans to make with. One of the really early people was Alwinda who um, sailed with uh, others, and she discovered that she would join the pirate trade. So she actually uh, worked her way up in the business, and uh, she was charismatic and was visiting on another ship where the pirate leader had been killed, and she was so charismatic, she ended up being captain. And she would raid through uh, the northern territories, and uh, Prince Alf, I think, was from King Canute the Fourth. Uh, was this had she was supposed to marry Prince Alf, but she didn't want to. She rebelled and ran away to sea. But later, Prince Alf was dispatched to capture her and stop her raiding. But he, and when he boarded her ship, he killed off most of her crew. And he went to attack Alwinda. But then when she, he took off her helmet, he discovered it was Alwinda. And lust happened. <laughs> and they ended up marrying and uh, shared in their wealth and his throne, because he was now king of one of the regions there. So um, things like that still continue to this day. Another interesting pirate was Captain Lewis, who uh, was on um, on Bannister's boat, and he, as a teenager, and he saw Bannister meet his fate. Um, and this is probably the most violent picture I'll show today. Um, but also, Lewis uh, was very charismatic at a storm and uh, attack from another pirate. He tore off his hair and waved it to the devil and great theatrical style. And people thought he was in league with the devil and this increased his uh, alpha male dominance amongst his crew. Um, and he went on and he met his fate. The other 
famous pirate is Blackbird, Blackbeard, uh, 1680 uh, to 1720. She only lived 40 years, uh, but it's believed because he could read and write, and he was from England, that he was actually a runaway from a, um, well, um, um, high status family in England. He was the rebel in the family. Um, he also was quite famous for, uh, oh, one of the things that evolved at that time was slavery. Slavery was so important to the New World, uh, particularly uh, in the South, the U.S., to uh, the slaves could pick a seed out of a pound of cotton per day. This is before Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. So, um, and there was the triangle trade, taking sugar uh, from the uh, cane fields in the Caribbean back to England, making rum, and also taking back cotton from uh, the south of the U.S. back to England, and they would bring it back to the U.S. and sell it. So, um, since they had rum, they were good at partying, and they were real drunkards and partiers, which we see here. And um, but he was also black. Was quite a warrior, and he's one of his things that terrify his um, competition, other pirates. He would take the wicks that were used to light the guns and light that would smoke, and they would take the wicks and touch the fuse on a, on a cannon. And he would stick them in his hair, and he would look like he had flaming hair. And that was one of his ways of terrorizing, intimidating his, the competition. <laughs> but he did meet his end. Uh, as pirates do. And one of the other interesting pirates I discovered was John Lafitte, who I had briefly heard about, but he's really important in uh, US history. And he was born in Malo, France, 1781. And here we see an angry view of him. But he was also quite famous. Uh, he worked his way up in the tray of various small boats and um, you know, as people do a business, they become uh, real estate moguls, etc. And uh, eventually had big pirate ships and stealing rum and silk and cotton and everything. But he would take it. Um, Oh, here's one of his really neat tricks. The long bowsprit on a pirate ship is a neat trick to shove it up the stern of a <laughs> ship you want to board. And the crew could run up the bowsprit. They didn't have to pull up alongside and tie up. They could just hop on this way and get it to wipe out the other crew. Which I found quite <laughs> an interesting trick. He was quite famous for going to the Orleans in the South US, and he discovered this neat little. Where is it? Ah, okay. Bar which he set up. And that became his warehouse, where he would go and store all his goods. And then he would take the 
crew would take it by canoe up to the bayous, up to the islands, and up to this mass, the house of Jean Lafitte on Bourbon Street, the islands, where he would sell it as a regular store. He subsequently became one of, or if not the richest person in the U.S. at that time by this trade. And there was this huge business uh, from his warehouse on Baxter Island to his tavern in uh, New Orleans, which still is there today. And I once drank, uh, tried a uh, shot of Pernod there as part of history. <laughs> the government, the because of his trade and um, dealing from all the other ships, the French and the Spanish and the British, as is classical with privateers, um, this was at the start of the War of 1812. And he was asked uh, by General Jackson, otherwise known as Stonewall Jackson, on uh, his march to the sea during the Civil War, and the governor of Louisiana, Claiborne, if he would defend New Orleans against the British. So he became a huge hero for doing this which was something I didn't know before I found the Pirates book. He subsequently was pardoned by the President of the United States, Madison, and the Secretary of State was Monroe. So there was this long description in quite eloquent verbiage about his being pardoned uh, for running his pirate store in the Orleans and defending it. So I won't bore you with all this. I did a little rush of time, so I didn't get a little summary point. But he was quite pardoned. And you see here it's signed by the President James Madison in 1815 when Madison was the 39th president of the United States. Which is an amazing twist, how bad guys can become good guys. <laughs> However, <laughs> all of us, make your money and then be a philanthropist. <laughs> so it turns out, after saving the Orleans, Lafitte got a little bored. He couldn't go back. He didn't have his Barrett Island again as a warehouse. So he went off to Houston, Texas. And he took up his trade, his uh, hobby become avocation. So he went and plundered the Spanish ships and resold their uh, French and sold their goods in Houston making even more money. <laughs> but his competitors um, had their way with him. So he ended up being dispatched to the early shellbacks in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, why are some people bad? <laughs> This is a problem in this evolution, descending it from lower animals. <coughs> and it's really going to turn out to be society's um, problem with the United Nations, <coughs> etc., and charismatic <coughs> positive leaders who can relate with other leaders of countries to keep us all out of evil. So let's look a little deeper. Given my curiousness about the human brain, why, what is good and evil in the human brain? And the scientific challenge, 
for nature versus nurture in the brain, how does behavior influence growth of neurons and astrocytes to support cells in our brain? For the genetic controls, genetic control of axons and sinuses, for larger or smaller brain regions, what is structurally different? So, the first year I was in Toronto, I used to go to a hard house for dinner. And one night I saw this sign that said, Costume Debate, Beezle Bob versus Joan of Arc. <laughs> Beezle Bob, I remind you, was derived from a Philistine god formerly worshipped in Ekron and later adopted by some uh, uh, Abrahamic religions as a given name to a major demon, the devil. And Joan of Arc, um, who was eventually became a Roman Catholic saint for saving France against the Brits. And it's believed that she had temporal lobe epilepsy and heard voices of God from the speech regions in her brain saying, save the country. So she was charismatic and got her troops together and fought off the Brits but she eventually met her fate. And she, if I get this right, during the Inquisition there, she was asked, are you blessed by God? And she says, I don't know, but maybe he should, <laughs> she said. And there are all these anecdotes about her. So the topic of the debate is evil is present. So there was a marvelous costume debate between Beelzebub and Joan of Arc, which I don't remember very much about because it was in 1982. However, I do remember the comment by uh, a lady debater from the debate club. And it's politically incorrect now, but I could say she was a sweet young thing in a tight sweater. <laughs> Which she did hear from me. So she said, uh, love is the opposite of evil. I'm a virgin. I do not have love. Therefore, evil is present. <laughs> You know, we got smiles by the audience here. <laughs> so by background, none of us are evil. I came across this really interesting book, Freakonomics. And, the, and it was, let me back up one. It was written by two upscale economists in 25. Uh, I think it was Levitt who got a Nobel Prize about eight or ten years later for complex economic behavior. And the question was, based on the statistics of US and cities, what's the cause of crime rate reduction? This is a really interesting bit of evolutionary history. <coughs> it turns out crime rate reduction is highly correlated with availability of abortions for states and cities across the US, Canada, and European countries where the data is available. An amazing bit of statistics. Uh, in 1973, the US Supreme Court, in the decision to Roe versus Wade, the um, the majority opinion written by Harry Blackburn addressed this specifically, which is an important bit of history. The detriment that the state should impose upon a pregnant woman by denying this choice altogether is apparent. Maternity or additional offspring may force upon the woman a stressful life and future psychological harm may be imminent. Mental and physical health 
maybe tax like childcare. There was also the distress for all concern associated with the unwanted child. And there was the probability of bringing a child into a family already unable psychologically and of course financially unable to care for it. That is, unwanted children get ignored, uh, they're unloved, they don't untaught, missing social skills, they don't get self-worth, and they join gangs to have families. Disaster happens. And it's one of the things we should all be aware of when we look at laws controlling abortions and unwanted pregnancies. It, this is the statistics. <laughs> the other really neat background book I twigged on was the psychopath test. Wow. Robert Hare, who is now in his 80s at UBC, developed the psychopath test. And uh, this is the revised psychopath test. Sorry. Um, which, in brief form of 20 questions, <laughs> which I won't bore you with the, all the details, Oops. but it talks about um, glib and superficial charm. Grandeur and self worth, need for simulation or proneness, uh, proneness to boredom, pathological lying, cunning and manipulativeness, lack of remorse or guilt, shallow affect, that is emotional uh, uh, behavior, callousness and lack of empathy, parasitic lifestyle, um, poor behavioral controls. <laughs> Um, promiscuous behavior, early behavior problems like they'll kill their cats. Fire <laughs> setting, blue sniffing, alcohol, running away from home. Lack of realistic long term goals. Impulsivity, irresponsibility, uh, failure to accept responsibility for own actions. Um, many short term marital relations, a juvenile delinquency, revocation of the condition of release, they get pardoned, they uh, don't um, follow through, and criminal versatility. They learn the wrong stuff. <laughs> the other really neat thing I tweaked on was I the National Graphic, and there was a really neat article in it. This was January 2018. There was this neat article, Science of Good and Evil, which is an amazing article. I heard about some of the data in here, but I didn't know who the people were. And I got, so I started following up on this. There was Kent Keel a psychologist from New Mexico, he put an MRI machine in a trailer and went around and scanned 4,000 incarcerated murderers and other criminals. And he also gave the psychopath test to them. They were rated high on the psychopath index and they had smaller amygdalas in their brain. That's the region that is responsible for controlling fear and connected to the judgment centers in the frontal lobes of the brain. And they went on and published serious scientific papers, which we'll come back to in a moment. And here's one of them, and I just give the title, Functional Connectivity in Incarcerated Male Adolescents with Psychopath 
traits. The other really neat person in this story was Abigail Marsh. When she was 19, she was driving a car on a busy, rainy thoroughfare, and a dog ran across, and she swerved to avoid the dog. She ended up in the other lane facing oncoming traffic on a bridge, and the car stalled. A really terrifying moment for her. Some man got out of his uh, on the other lane, ran across traffic to help her get the car restarted, having risked his life in doing this. She always wondered why somebody would do this. She twigged on, and she wondered if altruistic people, the opposite of, the opposite of psychopaths, Altruistic people who will do things for others, risking their own lives quite often in the process. She went on to do a PhD in psychology. And she twigged on kidney donors. Kidney donors rarely get compensated even for the surgery in their trouble. They give one of their kidneys for free to somebody who needs it. Why would they do that? So she wondered if these altruistic people are the opposite of psychopaths. So she went and scanned them and gave them tests to measure their uh, recognition of fear and wellness. So one of the things she did we show them pictures of a smiling face, neutral face, and an angry face. From happy to fearful. What parts of the brain would be active when they were detecting this? And here we see pictures from an MRI machine. Would you like it's a quick summary of how an MRI machine works? It's quite magical. Sure. Yes. 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 So, being sailors, you know when you wear a, wave a magnet over a compass needle, the compass needle moves because the compass needle is also a little magnet discovered BC before the common era by the Chinese who used in their early navigation. Also, if you wave have a magnetic field by a moving magnet, it will generate a current in a wire. So picture thousands of little compasses and you wave a magnet. They all move. And then they recoil, they come back to the resting condition. And because they're a moving magnet, they also generate a magnetic field. Now to the body. Put a magnetic field, light person down in the magnetic MRI machine, magnetic resonance imaging. It used to be called nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, but they, nuclear was a bad word in the <laughs> clinic. <coughs> so we flash a big moving magnetic field. And it turns on the human tissue. If it's not the brain, they look will look at kidney or um, knees or whatever. Water molecules are magnetically polar. They're asymmetric and act like a little compass. So gazillions of these little magnets all move, and then they'll recoil. And there's another antenna which picks up this produced magnetic field and hence doing it in layers, you can see the 3D image. In the brain, it turns out that hemoglobin molecules in red blood cells 
have iron molecules in them. And iron molecules uh, in the hemoglobin, millions of them per red blood cell, are ma magnetically polar. So they, when you flash a magnetic field, the magnetic, the hemoglobin molecules in red blood cells all go whoosh. And they turn off the magnet field and they come back. And they make a magnetic field. It's a moving magnet. Another antenna picks up that magnetic field. Now, the really neat thing is hemoglobin molecules having oxygen on them or CO2 on them have different weights. So they recoil fast or slow. And hence, they can, when you take the 3D reconstruction from an MRI machine, you can tell what parts of the brain are metabolically active, requiring oxygen for all their energy um, jobs that they have to do, uh, re, uh, restoring uh, neurotransmitters, etc. So it's indicating what parts of the brain are metabolically active. So, in this case, you see the right amygdala is the one responding to these spaces. Turns out, the altruistic people, the kidney donors, have bigger right amygdalas. So this is really, I think, quite exciting. Fearful faces cause a greater response in the right amygdala than in control group. Separately, the researchers found that the right amygdala is more on average 8% larger than those of the control group. <coughs> Similar studies that previously on psychopath found the opposite effect, smaller amygdala. This is an amazing discovery. Like you have a like bigger or smaller muscle, you have bigger or smaller part of your brain to do its job. And here's um, one of the, the early papers by Evan Marsh. And here's the amygdala sitting at the base of the brain. Cerebellum front, and these are the frontal lobes, which do judgment, and the amygdala is connected to a lot. And uh, the anatomy of empathy shows the amygdala responding when you show. Um, ah. If you uh, evaluate humans, such as physicians, and um, typically scoring higher on um, uh, empathy quotients, they will have a bigger response. Uh, a better an activity model for amygdala. This is the brain facing that way, the eyes would be here. And the holes in the brain, uh, the ventricles originally discovered by Leonardo da Vinci, uh, which are part of where the cerebral spinal fluid can flow to recirculate into the veins. And the connections uh, from the amygdala are many parts of the brain and pain now is believed to go into the sick pain fibers from the sensation centers the sensors that over the body to end up in the anterior cingulate and the hippocampus uh, which regulates memories 
all will go to the amygdala. And a hypothalamus is the region that's active in, in pleasure. And the outputs go all over. And I didn't get the play version of this work. So I just left it. And his other uh, regions that you can, for postpartum depression, uh, the blue part, uh, the cardiac nucleus and the frame, uh, are the non infant related cues or infant related cues. Um, also appear in the amygdala. I'll just skip over this. It's a bit technical. However, includes in genetics and nurture. Yes, I thought those turned out to be a really interesting individual who suffered from lipoid protein Proteinosis. Now, it was the genes that regulate cell membranes, which are made of lipids and proteins that form various channels and regulations of the cells, didn't work for her. So she has holes in her brain where the amygdala would be. She has no fear. They showed her snakes and spiders, which uh, other primates, the monkeys, are responsive to. And they choked and they did experiments on her and showed her all sorts of uh, fearful situations. And when the primates' amygdalas are cut out, legions are made there, the monkey do not have fear of spiders, snakes, etc. Here's an individual that due to some genetic um, uh, problem didn't have an amygdala. And she also happened to have taken a walk through a park and was attacked by a knight, by a man with a knight. <coughs> she had no fear of that. She, next day, she went back and walked through the park at night again. Hmm. So, and this individual is being uh, act, uh, seriously investigated. And by a point in history, um, there was a patient called H.M. Um, who is dead now, but uh, was when in the 70s, uh, 60s and 70s, one of the treatments for serious epilepsy was to go in with like a stiletto and make a cut under the temporal lobe and cut uh, the hippocampus and amygdala. Turned out that this subject, HM, could not remember anything new. And it was Brenda Milner of the Montreal Neuro when I was there, who in fact interviewed HM. She gave him, well, the Penfield asked her to go interview this subject. And Psychological testing was a little primitive in the 60s. And she did the normal things. And then she said, well, I'm going to go have coffee now. I want you to remember numbers. I want you to remember four, five, three. So she goes out, comes back in 15 minutes after having her coffee, and says, Henry, what are the numbers? He says, four, five, three. So she goes on and does something else for five minutes, and then she says, Henry, what are the numbers? What numbers? <laughs> he could not remember anything new. This was a major discovery 
in lesions in the brain about the start of memory research in humans. And as one of the profs that I heard give a talk on this, uh, when he asked the student who HM was, the student replied, hippocampal man, uh, which was amongst the scientists, this always gets a big joke. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> applause, applause. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you see uh, the conclusion. Genetics and nurture determine fear and aggressive behavior <clears throat> from parrots to humans. Nurturing of children is extremely important to teach them self-worth and social skills. Mentoring of students, buttering up your boss, um, all of this is extremely important. So how does behavior change the brain? This is a really ongoing hot topic. So be altruistic, do unto others as you want them to do unto you. Grow your amygdala. <laughs> Summer's coming. <laughs> Are there uh, any questions, Jim? Would you prefer to take it too? Yes, and you have to speak up because I'm a little hard of hearing. Well, what kind of what kind of DNA research has been done in, in order to determine what gets passed on from generation to generation? In, in, in so you got half your genes from one parent, the other half from the other parent, <coughs> and from the original Mendel experiments on peas, peas, little peas, etc. <coughs> he made a little matrix. Um, a and B uh, for the genes. And you can have two copies of the gene, one copy of a gene, or no copies of the gene. If you have both copies, you have a full trait. If you have one gene, you have half the trait. And if you have no copies of the gene, you don't have the trait. And all that applies, and it's a hot topic in molecular biology today, how genes work. And I said in um, four biochemistry <coughs> courses a year ago, and after every, because all of this is, the majority of it is in the last 10 years, 15 years. And after every lecture, I said, amazing. Thank goodness I'm not taking the exam. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, how much detail is available now is amazing. And I think the other question was over here first, thank you. <coughs> Sir. Uh, can you predict behavior based on the size of the amygdala? For instance, Say both me I and MDP have got a big amygdala, Tories have a small one? Pardon? <laughs> 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 can you predict behavior based on the size of the amygdala? Doug Ford has a tiny one, NDP have big ones? Possibly. This is a huge topic now. That's assuming um, Doug Ford has a brain. I can uh, scan uh, school students, and there's some efforts to scan students in their social skills, etc. And but you can't put them all in an MRI machine. That technology is not currently available. Man. It was just recently on the news, very recently, about a man who desperately needed a kidney, I think in Calgary, yes. and he put a big billboard yeah. with his name, I'm sure many people saw it on the news, his name I, and his phone number, and finally a man phoned him out of the clear blue, also in Calgary, because he had a particular, I think he had a special O negative or something, which is rare, and a man who he had never met, volunteered to give him his kidney. And I mean, talking about altruism was just beautiful. I'm sure other people saw it. Did you see it on the news? It was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, I saw that also. Yeah. Okay, I think there was a question here next. 
Yeah, I'm um, curious about that patient SM. Yes. Um, the woman without fear. Yeah. Having walked through the park and being attacked and then going through the park the next day. Clearly, it's not a question of memory that she she would remember that she was attacked the next day but not be afraid. She that, had no fear of it. She had no fear. But you know, what do you think makes fear? Is it is it memory or is it imagination? And memory meaning things that have happened in the past, things that HM would not have. Or is it imagination which is to think about what will happen in the future? Well, she was she was a mathematician like our speaker, and she knew if odds were it wouldn't happen again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things in evolution is how is memory and to be able to predict the future, to be able to find food, mate, or know what pleases a mate, or where food would be stored. Yeah, and so that's yeah. part of it. And but fear didn't, she wasn't able to predict that she would, might get hurt again. Right, so we're not afraid of things that have happened. Right. We're afraid of things that will happen. Yes. Um, and is the amygdala connected to future thinking? Yes. And frontal lobes for judgment. Right. So judgment is an aspect of future right. thinking. And the pirates of the area. And I think. I was just wondering if you anybody's ever tested the size of the amygdala and you just said frontal lobes of those who <coughs> always barge at the windward mark. What was the punchline? It relates to the frontal lobes of the How many can has anybody George, tested the George, size of the George, amygdala and the George, presence of frontal lobes in those sailors who always barge at the windward mark? <laughs> Not that I know of. The application to sailors to show the bad pirates and the, the Ahabs of the world, and then you have the, the, the sailors are the good ones. Uh, and take great risk. Where where do we generally fit in both? <laughs> like all people, there's a statistical distribution, and we're find out at the weather mark. <laughs> you, have some, you, have some, you have some pirates on the race next. So <laughs> yeah. No, they're in the committee. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any comments as to your conclusions with respect to application to those in the military who receive training at an early age to be, shall we say, evil and then have to be, to unlearn when they are discharged from the military? Some of them apparently don't, uh, specifically in the U.S., not so much here, right? Because that would be, seem to be nurture triumphing over nature in yes. a deliberate attempt by the government to do so. If you spend professional life learning how to kill and wreck um, injury on others, it's hard to unlearn all that. And that's what's going on with these people. And is there any research to help unlearn, shall we say? A big topic in, um, in neuroscience and funded by the Department of Defense. But the majority of the Def Department of Defense money goes into um, limb robotics. And recently in the San Diego neuroscience meeting, there was a demonstration of a robotic arm and the subject had lost his lower limb to cancer and there was a robotic arm with elbow and fingers and thumb and the little um, sensors around the bicep with which he would control it. And when it was unplugged from the, the post in his arm, somebody else would hold it and he could move it, the arm. And he could even play the piano with it. And that's, 
uh, yeah. enormous amounts of money going into robotics for um, um, crippled soldiers. But more has to go into the training. And it's not as well funded as it should be. And also the whole effort of this happened here now also in Canada is about criminals who are incarcerated and put in solitary confinement that compared to um, some of the European countries where there's a huge rehab program for criminals. They're not locked up and put in solitary confinement. They're actually taught and they're put in halfway houses. And they become um, compatible members of society again. And it costs much less money to rehab them rather than just to lock them up and not kill them and feed them. Do you ever see, uh, do you ever see the situation where the parole board will do an MRI before they uh, let somebody out? They should. I have not. But it probably will come. One more question. But the thing is, with, with the uh, incarcerated people, etc., and the success in the Scandinavian.